Hello class, this is, phrase means life without government. The state of nature would be what humans would be like naturally if there were no government. Now, once you get that word down, the term, the state of nature, you can define it as life with no government. And once you've written that down, that there's no government in the state of nature. We're just on our own, everyone for themselves. The second thing you should write down about the state of nature is the other word for that is anarchy. So the third thing you can say is that when there's anarchy, which is life with no government in the state of nature, all the same things so far, there is danger right now i want to be very clear we all know that the government can be dangerous too right let's, let's look at the george floyd situation we can imagine that the government itself could be dangerous there's no denying that let's get it out front right look at what's going on throughout our country I'll try to show my it's backwards to you all but um, and I, I rarely, actually never, reveal my political um, leanings, but Black Lives Matter is just, it's not even a political leaning, it's just the right thing. So, sorry, I had to get my two cents in there. Um, but this is the great part about this class, right, is that we're going to talk about stuff that's happening right now. So, yes, we are living in the last couple weeks of seeing when government can be dangerous the officer that killed george floyd was dangerous but we're talking about the broader sense of what if there just was no government no government at all and here's the argument i'm going to make as bad as it is and it is unacceptably bad in terms of this you know police violence against people of color unacceptable but in the state of nature it's something completely different there are no police at all. There are no judges at all. And you could think of it as a hypothetical place because how long could human beings really live if there were no one, say, in control of, let's just think of stuff that we need on a daily basis. No one in control of getting fresh drinking water to the public. Think about that. So let's go back. Remember we're saying that the third thing about the state of nature, third thing about anarchy... It's life without government, it's anarchy, and characteristic is very simple, very straightforward. The state of nature, when there's no government, it's going to be violent. So there's three words that Thomas Hobbes said, who's a kind of a famous philosopher on this issue. I like to add one more. He says nasty, brutish, and short. And I like to say nasty, cruel, brutish, and short. What are those four words describing? Life when there's no government. Life in the state of nature, life in anarchy. Life in anarchy, life in the state of nature is nasty, cruel, brutish, and short. None of those words sound very good, do they? So nasty or cruel, think about how does that sound off the top of your head, right? That, that's probably the easiest of the words there to interpret what that could feel like. Brutish, we don't use very often, but you think about brute force, and you're talking about people, whoever's the strongest or has the biggest weapon is going to win. And what do we mean win? Survive. Why does there have to be violence if there's no government? Why can't people, are, you might say, Professor B, come on. Most people are pretty good. They wouldn't just go around killing each other. Even if you assume that's true, that human beings are inherently good. It's very, very, very likely that in some point, probably fairly quickly into real life anarchy, there'd be someone, let's say, who came upon some fresh drinking water and there's no government to share this drinking water. So this person has found it. And this is the most kind, generous person in the history of the world. You, they just love sharing and sharing and sharing. They wouldn't, they're not violent. They don't fit our mold of this definition of violence without government. But then after days and weeks of people coming and borrowing water and taking it and this person letting them over and over, there comes a point where there's only enough water for this person's 
And I'm going to even take it even further. Remember, this is the nicest person we've ever heard of. They're even willing to die of thirst so that you can drink. But let, have you met anyone like that? That you don't know that's that nice? So first of all, it's already getting pretty unrealistic, right? To find a person that would be willing to share the last of their water so that they die and you don't. Now let's add one more. They have a child. And instead, they're willing to die for you as a stranger because they're that nice and they don't want to be violent and they don't want to push you and take the water for themselves. But they have a child. Are they going to let their child die of thirst or are they going to give it to a stranger? Here's what, what, what are we saying by this scenario? Now you see where there could be a violence, right? Because at some point, there's no one in charge, and so people have to take things into their own hands, decide for themselves. At some point, someone's going to get hurt, and there are no cops to call. Now, some the way we feel about police in our country right now may feel like, hey, I'll take that. But just know this. The idea of the state of nature, the idea of anarchy, is the idea of it's basically everyone is at war with everyone else. Everyone's for themselves. There are no police to call. There are no judges to settle disputes. There is no one in authority. Everyone is uncontrolled. They can do whatever they want. Okay, so that's the state of nature. Now let's move on to the second term that you guys need to know. I say, you guys, I'm, it's all inclusive. I say y'all, but trying to leave, trying to leave that from behind. Uh, so if I say y'all or you guys, forgive me, I just mean everyone. The second thing is very important here, and that is the social contract. The social contract is the way we get out of the state of nature, okay? The way we get out of the state of nature, which is anarchy, is human, and so if you're all ready to write this down, the way we get out of anarchy, the way we leave life without government, the way we leave the state of nature is to enter into a social contract. The social contract is a fancy way of saying this. You are now in civilization. Okay, so social contract, if you want to put one word to start for your definition, is civilization. Now, this is really important. Civilization does not mean you are a Thai necessarily you have a western job or anything it doesn't fit one particular civilization here's what we define civilization as there are authority figures that are respected and if they're not respected they're at least legitimate and what we mean by that is they may not be universally respected but they're able to put forward rulings and punishments that will apply to the people so, for example, if you went to the border of Venezuela and Brazil and were meeting with the Motoloni indigenous people, you would find that their civiliza civilization is, and I'm going to use the same word to define it, is civilized. They don't dress the way that um, Western people do. They have their own culture and their own intricacies, but they have authority. They have some type of government. They, and here's the key, this is the second good definition for social contract, is that in the social contract, you're giving up your right to kill. You're giving up your right to steal. You're giving up your right to hurt people. All the rights that you had in anarchy, you could do anything you wanted, for better or worse, right? So now in the social contract, you're giving up those rights, and you're saying, Essentially, I don't want the right to kill, to steal, and all that, because that means everyone else is going to have that right, too, and I'm going to live in a violent, chaotic, orderless world. That That's what anarchy is, right? So to get out of anarchy, the social contract gives you – you have to give up something. It gives you order. Now you have civilization, right? But you have to give up a lot of the rights that you had in – the state of nature. You can't hurt people anymore, essentially, right? That's th that's sort of the universally accepted norm um, of, of harming another person as, is where government would, at the minimum, get involved, right? So now that we have the social contract, it's another way of saying it 
is you're not signing a literal contract. The social contract is agreeing to give up certain rights to the government. And why would you ever do that? Why would you ever give up rights to the government? Why would you trust? Here's why. Because if you don't, you live in anarchy. So a trade-off, that's what civilization is essentially, right? It's a trade-off. It's saying, okay, I'm going to give the government some power over me, and I'm going to accept the legitimacy of this power. But the good news is for democracy and things like that, you can vote and change the leadership. So state of nature, anarchy, life with no government. We don't want to live there too long or we'll all be in big trouble. So we get out of there by entering a social contract. You're not actually signing it. It's an agreement living in civilization that we all know we don't have certain rights anymore and that's okay. We don't want those rights because then we could be hurting people and they could be hurting us and there would be no consequence at least not a government consequence. Okay, so now that we've got the foundation, and well done again for each of you who have been um, responding to that first query of why do we have government? Excellent responses. Now you have a little more background of why I asked that question. So it's kind of a setup question because I'm, and I'm admitting that the government, whoever the government is of whatever country you're in is not gonna be perfect, right? But my argument is because I'm a government teacher, the government is probably going to be better than anarchy. Um, sometimes it won't feel that way, but that's so, – so stay with me. Even if you disagree and you want to be an anarchy, just know what anarchy is and know what the social contract is so that on the test you're good to go. All right? Again, just so you all know, I don't judge anyone on the basis of their political opinion, their political ideology, as long as it's not hateful. You could be communist, you could be anarchist, you could be socialist, you could be um, libertarian, you could be Green Party, you could be Republican, Democrat, Independent. I'm probably missing a bunch. As long as you're not hateful, I'm ready to hear it. Let's talk. It's awesome. It doesn't matter if you if you believe in anarchy or or um, communism. It, my job is to teach you why you believe it, to help you understand why you believe what you believe. So when you go vote. If you're able and you want to, you know why you're voting the way you're voting. I'm never going to tell you who to vote for, but I'm going to try to help you understand that when you have these feelings of a supporting a candidate or a cause, you now have the full information behind why you support it or don't. Um, so anyway, that's kind of the fun part of my job is we got an election coming up in a couple months. So hopefully I can do my part to get you all excited and um and hopefully voting if, you, if you're able. Okay, so democracy. We got through the first main part, excellent job. Everyone still with me? All right, so democracy. Cornerstones of democracy, and what we're gonna define democracy as is a form of government that gives power to its people. Okay, so let's just, just start with that basic definition. A, a form of government that gives power to the people. Now, in a communist system, you may not have much power, and we're going to go over, we're going to expand this definition. This is just the basic definition. There's power in the people when you have a democracy, right? You can see this right now. Look on the streets of the United States. There's power in protests, right? There's power in the people. So, and then voting, right? And we're going to go through all this. But, so, okay, so power in the people. Number one, and there's no particular order. I'm not going to test you on the order of things uh, per se. So for the test, I'll only ever ask you four details. So if I give you, say, eight on one of these lectures, you know your top four, you're good to go. Okay? So democracy in no particular order. What do we need? Here's what we're going to say right now. We're going to answer this question. What characteristics do I need to have a democracy? If I took one of these characteristics away, it's no longer a democracy. Let's list those, these key characteristics of democracy. You have to have them or it's just not a full democracy. Ready? Number one in no particular order, free speech. Free speech. And so when you write this down, there's one thing you should write next to it that for this class and for American politics is the single most important thing you can remember, which is freedom of speech specifically means that you can criticize the government. 
without getting in trouble. That's what it means. So, yes, it means you can say a cuss word here and there and this and that, but that's not that's not actually really what the essence of the First Amendment is. And so, so for our class, the First Amendment is what delineates or outlines this freedom of speech, right? We have four freedoms in the First Amendment. So if you want to actually write this down and get it now, it'll be great to get ahead of it, okay? So First Amendment is, and we're talking about, remember, cornerstones of democracy, things you have to have for it to be a democracy. Freedom of speech is right there at the beginning. Freedom of speech gives us the right to criticize government without getting in trouble, right? Why is that a good thing? I'll tell you why. Because the government is fallible. The government makes mistakes. And if we can't criticize them without going to jail, this is going to be a really bad situation, isn't it? Imagine every single person, every single person that's been protesting, peacefully or otherwise, gets thrown in jail. There are countries where that would happen, and there are also countries where no one would show up on the streets to protest because they know they'll get shot down. Um, so if you get a chance, you may not be able to find information if you go through TikTok or something, but you could look up Tiananmen Square in China and see what happened about 20 years ago or so to a group of students who are protesting. So what am I saying? Number one right of a democracy is to have the freedom of speech without fearing getting killed by the government, right? Criticize the government without getting in trouble. In our First Amendment, we have four freedoms, so that was just one. The second one that goes right with it is freedom of the press. So it's the same thing. It's just saying, saying what you're saying in print or today on Twitter or on Instagram or on TikTok or on Facebook or I'm missing a bunch, right? whatever the online platform. So freedom of the press is right there with freedom of speech. It's, you know, just saying speech is not necessarily amplified. The press is obviously amplifying, meaning giving your message to a larger number of people, right? So those are both hand in hand in the constitution. First amendment, pretty neat that the constitution doesn't even wait for like the eighth or ninth. First, right up front, they're like freedom of speech, and freedom of the press, okay? And then there's two others that go with that. One of them you're seeing right now on the streets all across the United States, and this is three, the right to assembly. Assembly is not that boring thing you went to in high school or middle school. Assembly means you protest. You're out there marching. Now, obviously, peaceful protest is what you're, you're granted, but it's really a big deal, isn't it, to be able to go out in the hundreds of thousands or millions of people and peacefully protest and hopefully, according to the Constitution, not be, um, you know, beaten up for it or, or anything. Unless, obviously, if, if there's situations where there's people rioting. But we're talking about peaceful protest is 100% protected by the U.S. Constitution. In fact, if you all get a chance to read a amazing, powerful letter that would resonate right now, in history more than many times it could ever other resonate which is martin luther king jr's letter from birmingham jail he wrote this to the outside world when he was trying to march in birmingham and he's he knows his constitution martin luther king right there first one it says i can assemble first amendment let's go i'd like to assemble please and this is kind of a normal way you would do it, right? You'd go to the city and you'd say, we'd like to have a march on such and such a date. The city will say, okay, well, in order to do that, we have to clear off these streets and make sure everything's safe. And the city has to do it. That's your right, right? And so what did they say in Martin Luther King Jr.'s case? Oh, you don't know. No, the Constitution doesn't apply to you. What? Yes, that's what it said. And that's outrageous and that's incorrect, right? And thank God history showed that it was incorrect and it should have always been incorrect. But of course, Martin Luther King Jr. had the right to protest there. They just didn't like what he was saying. Irrelevant, absolutely irrelevant. Now, some countries around the world may not be comfortable with the amount of free speech we have because in the United States, it goes really, really far. Um, I'm going to give you a case, just as sort of a shocking case to just give you an idea of how intense the freedom of speech is in the United States. 
there's a group of people that call themselves a church. They call themselves the Westboro Baptist Church. And they are a hate group. And what they do is they go to or have gone to and made a habit of going to military funerals and mocking the dead soldier and his or her parents and condemning them saying, and this is not me, this is what they say. They say, your son or daughters got punished because of the United, this is their belief. They say that because there's acceptance of homosexuality, God has punished your child and now they're dead. Wow. Shocking. Goes to the Supreme Court. This was, a, this was years ago, probably six years ago. Goes to the Supreme Court. Think about how vile that speech is. I think we can all agree. That's, that's hate speech. Straight up horrible hate speech, right? They're going to military funerals. First of all, military funerals. Come on, man. We're talking about someone who's died for the country. But then what they're saying is so vile and so hateful, right? So it goes to the Supreme Court, and the question was, are they allowed to do this? And the Supreme Court said yes. And this is really important why. I, we're all hopefully agreeing that this is vile speech and disgusting and hateful. But the Supreme Court said it's political speech. And because they were criticizing the fact that America, the United States, allows gays to now openly serve in the military, that was the Westboro Baptist the hate group, that was their position, that because of this policy, you know, people are dying as, as I don't want to say, as vile as that is, the Supreme Court said, you can say that as long as you stay a certain distance away, you can do that because you're doing political speech. So what are we saying? If, if the Supreme Court can allow that speech, you better bet that a Martin Luther King Jr., should have been able to, on the first time, had his free speech and done his demonstration. But in 1960 in Birmingham, Alabama, that wasn't the case. He goes to demonstrate. The government of that town says, no, we don't like what you have to say. And they don't let him and they throw him in jail when he tries. For exercising his constitutional rights, Martin Luther King Jr. was thrown in jail. And that's where he wrote that amazing letter. That's a freebie. Go read that. That will, it's, it's not an assignment, but it's just a must do. So good. So powerful. Letter from Birmingham jail. Okay. So we've got democracy. We just listed three things, right? That are essential in democracy, freedom of speech, freedom of press and freedom of assembly. The fourth, this is all packed in the first amendment in the United States constitution. The first 10 amendments to our constitution are called the bill of rights. So when you hear people say well, the bill of rights, just think, oh, that's the first 10 amendments. When you say amendments, what does that mean? Just think laws. It's, it's easier maybe to say it that way in your head. First law of our country, first, first thing that we established. And then here's number four of that first part, because there's four parts to it. Freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of assembly, and then freedom of religion. Okay, so freedom of religion. If you're writing this down, that's your fourth thing that's necessary in democracy. You have to have freedom of religion. Without it, you're not a full democracy. That's part and parcel of what a democracy brings is, in John F. Kennedy's words, not forcing upon the country your religion or letting the country force upon you their religion. I may be saying it ver not quite verbatim, but the idea is this. No one's going to force their religion on you from the government. And you're not going to go to the government and force your religion on them. The government stays out of religion. You probably heard the term separation of church and state. I'll tell you a little uh, final jeopardy question. That actually is not in the Constitution. The term separation of church and state is not in the Constitution. And you might say, what? Now, to be fair, the idea of it is all over the Constitution. Those exact words aren't. Those exact words came from a letter that Thomas Jefferson wrote to the Danbury Baptists. You do not need to know that unless you take some American political history with me. But the separation of church and state 
comes about from the idea that Thomas Jefferson wrote in that letter and then is reflected in the Constitution, basically saying this, the government is neutral on religion. The government's supposed to be neutral. Now, do we have, in God we trust on American money? Yeah. Do we say um, under God in the Pledge of Allegiance? Yeah. So is there perfect separation of church and state? That's a great paper topic. So those of you who are, who are thinking that's interesting, really good paper topic right there. Okay, so we mentioned four things that in the United States are all captured in one single amendment, which is freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of uh, assembly, and freedom of religion. All right? Cheers. Seltzer water. So, I know, weird habit. So in all, um, all in all, those first four rights you you could argue are one right in the United States, but they're they're four separate um, rights. Okay, so democracy, those are four things that we've just now mentioned. Let's mention a couple more, and then we'll conclude our, our first lecture. So, um, so you don't get too overloaded. All right. So, what else does democracy have? So next on your list, we need to put this. Democracy has what's called a free market economy. If you've never heard of a free market economy, just you could write the word capitalism. Now, if you don't know what either of those are, really, here's a very simple way of putting capitalism or free market economy into perspective for you. It's the economy that if you're in the United States right now, you live under. It means that for every Target, there's a Walmart. For every Pepsi, there's a Coke. For every McDonald's, there's a Burger King, right? There is a competition which is what the free market is, among competing enterprises, entrepreneurs, products. And here's the great thing about the free market. There's, there's some things that may not be so great, which in capitalism, we'll, we, we will admit that there are people who are going to be richer and some who are going to be poor. There's, just, there's no, no capitalist would deny that. That's a fact. Um, the, but what capitalists would argue is, yeah, the poor in our society may not be as wealthy as the super rich in a capitalist society, but the poor in a capitalist society are doing way better than the poor in any other society. Why? Because there's what they call upward mobility, meaning here, here's what you could say about democracy versus, say, communism. In democracy, everyone's supposed to get an equal opportunity, right? You're supposed to get an equal opportunity at, say, the American dream, right? But in a communist country, you don't just get the equal opportunity, you get an equal result. Guaranteed. That's what communism essentially is. It's saying, no matter how hard you work, this is your pay. Now, that might sound bad, but it also was meant to be good if you want to look at it from a different perspective. You could say communism is meant to tackle inequality. They're trying to make everyone make the same amount of money so there's no upper class and no lower class so that everyone's the same. If you're a free market person, a capitalist person, you're not going to like the government forcing people to make a certain amount of money or forcing people to sell their product for a certain amount of money or taking over the economy entirely, right? So here's what the simple definition of capitalism is. It's freedom to buy and sell. Does the government tax stuff and regulate stuff? Yeah, you can't say buy and sell, you know, heroin. Um... But the things that you can sell legally, of course you can sell it, don't do it illegally, but the things you can sell legally, um, the government is not putting a price on those things. They're not saying, oh, Verizon, you're coming out with a cell phone that needs to be $199. That's unthinkable, right, in our society, in our system of economics. So capitalist society is exactly what the United States is. It's buying and selling. And, and if you want to add one more really important thing that we don't even really think about these days, but we have to say, it's taken for granted, the right to private property. The right to private property. So, um, in fact, if you've ever seen the movie The Pursuit of Happiness with um, Will Smith, um, originally it wasn't life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It was life, liberty, and the pursuit of property. That's the most American thing ever. What am I saying? That, that, that's the essence of capitalism, right? So they changed it to be life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Um, 
But the fact that it was ever going to be life, liberty, and property shows you the fact that owning property is a huge. And what do you, what if you don't own a house? I don't own a house. I wish I did, but you might own a cell phone, right? Or a book, um, or a t-shirt. But in a communist country, things are just different. The entire economic system is different. Okay, so let's add a couple more things to our list. We're getting getting a pretty long list here for democracy, but somewhere we got to say this next part, which is voting. And so when you write down voting for your notes, it's really important to write down this. Not just the elections, which is what voting is. It's free and fair elections. Free and fair elections. So when you write that down, once you do, here's what the definition is. Free and fair elections means, first and foremost, that it doesn't cost any money, right? Because then you could automatically be discriminating against someone who's, say, homeless or doesn't have extra money, right? So that's, that's the, but the other thing that free means is the access. 18 or over, black, white, doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter your gender identity. Doesn't matter anything. You should be able to vote. You're allowed to vote, right? It's free to vote. But wait a minute. Have have we had problems in our country before where people are free to vote, but then when they actually go to vote, they don't actually get that freedom? Yes, that has happened. And those, for this next part, you could write down, were called Jim Crow laws. Jim Crow, when you hear those terms, you should think, racism in the south this is exactly what it was it was racism but it was a series of laws that were so racist that they were also insidious insidious is essentially meaning a hidden evil okay so martin luther king described jim crow laws as this even though he wasn't just talking about jim crow laws this is the perfect quote from him about this type of law he said so martin luther king says this sometimes a law looks just on its face but is unjust in practice so sometimes a law looks just on its face but it's unjust in practice what the heck does that mean that means this you this is what people did in the south you can say oh well we're gonna have a literacy test in order to vote so in order to vote, this is what Martin Luther King was saying. Here was the law, and here's how he's trying to break it down for us. The law was, oh, well, to be able to vote, you should at least be able to read the name of the candidates. See, that's what Martin Luther King's saying. It sounds just on its face, right? Oh, yeah, we just, we just want to make sure you can read the names of the candidates. But in practice, it wasn't just. So when you go to the actual voting booth, now, if you're African American in the South, during the Jim Crow era until the, the mid 1960s, you were you were going to be taking a test to read Shakespeare to see if you could vote. How is that constitutional? Another, I'm going to give you a couple more examples. Okay, so that's a Jim Crow law. Another one was a poll tax. They just said, look. If you want to vote, it costs us money to like set up the voting booths and everything. So you're going to have to pay a tax. And because African-Americans had just come out of slavery the generation before, it was obviously meant to, to pick on a certain group of people who had less resources. And so if, if you didn't have the money, you just couldn't vote. So a poll tax, that's enough. By the way, these are all now been ruled unconstitutional. Thank goodness, right? Another one was... The, the, this one, I, this one just is just so, it doesn't even fit Martin Luther King Jr.'s quote because he, they're not even trying to hide the racism. Then another one of these Jim Crow laws was called the Grandfather Clause. And that's just blatant racism. The Grandfather Clause said this, essentially, if your grandfather could not vote, you cannot vote. Okay, so that, that doesn't sound racist right off the top, but wait a minute. Now we go to the context of it, and you find it is extremely racist, 100% racist. That's the whole point of it, and that's why it's so disgusting, right? So the grandfather clause said you can only vote if your grandfather could have voted or did vote. What if your grandfather was a slave? 
that's so unfair and it's so unjust and it's so wrong. And that was the point of the law. That's why when we say free and fair elections, it's not good enough to just say, oh, yeah, you can vote. Everyone can vote now. But when you have those laws there, they're not it's not actually a free election. You're not actually free to vote. Right. So the grandfather clause was another one. A fourth and final. I'll give you one more Jim Crow law. These are these are nasty. Talk about nasty. A, a fourth one I had an encounter with in a very different way. And I will honestly say it changed my life. So when I was in my final class, so I'm finishing my dissertation, which is like the end part of your PhD. But when I was still taking my coursework and I had to take an American politics class, this American politics core course, it's PhD, it's, it's your final class, and then you're on to your exams and you're basically like, about to be a doctor of this subject, right? So stay with me. We had, we had 11 people in our graduate class at Claremont, Claremont graduate, and there were, every single one of us were nerds about political science from all over the world, but we just loved American politics. We wanted to learn about it. So we're in this class, this core course, we're taking this class. And, and just so you know, like the way grad school was, at least in my experience for PhD level classes, They'll give you an entire book to read and they'll say, come back next week and we'll discuss it. And then that's what you do for three hours, the whole class. And there's only 11, 10 people in the class. So if you didn't read it, it's really obvious. And then you have one test at the end and that's it. Whoa. Right. So one day we come in and our teacher says, clear your desk. There's a pop quiz. And we're all kind of offended because we're like, dude, we're nerds. We read it. We read the book. We'll just just talk about it. But this quiz wasn't about the book that we had read. It was something that I didn't know at the time. So I take this test and, and basically what it was before I tell you what it, the true essence of what it was, the test itself that she gave us was these unbelievably difficult and obscure questions about American politics, stuff that you'd probably find that even PhD students who studied this and knew just about everything about this topic still didn't know. So we take this test, we switch papers with each other, we grade it. And out of 11 people in the class, 10 of us failed. And I failed. I did. One person in our class passed this. Then our teacher tells us, you know what you just took was the 1959 test that Mississippi gave African Americans in order to be able to vote. Wow. So you're talking about a test that was intentionally impossible to pass. Now do you see what Martin Luther King Jr. was talking about? It seems just on its face, oh, you should know something about the Constitution to be, you know, to be a voter. And then the Constitution test comes, and if you're African American, you have to take it, and they make it unpassable. That is why we need free and fair elections. Free and fair, the fairness part, all those Jim Crow laws, unfair, racist, thankfully gone. One to think about in the modern sense, and I'm not going to take a side on this, but I'd like you to think about it, is, is requiring a voter ID a form of Jim Crow. Now, let me explain why some people think it wouldn't be, first of all. They say if you have to show an ID to buy you know, a bottle of shampoo at the grocery store with your credit card. You have to do, you have to show your ID to pierce your ear. You have to show your ID for anything. So uh, people are just going to do voter fraud if they, if we don't have voter IDs. The facts are there have been about 300 cases of voter fraud out of the last billion votes. Um, so it's like a 0.0001% chance. And, and here's why, just so you know. The punishment for voting twice? Are you really going to change the results of the election? Has it, when's the last election you know that's been determined by one vote? So for every vote you were to steal, you'd potentially get 10 years in federal prison and a $100,000 fine. So depending on, depending on how serious you are in trying to steal the election, you better be willing to go to jail for life to steal like five votes. So now... Going back, the people are going to say, but yeah, but voter fraud is going to end up happening if we don't require ID. Right now, you, you're not in many places. You're not requiring ID. You just go and tell your name, right? Um, so that that's just a question of 
is that you might say, well, just get an ID. How hard is it to get an ID? Well, what if you're homeless? What if you don't have a car? You're homeless. You don't have access to your original birth certificate. Your family's gone. How do you go to the DMV? How do you get to the DMV? How do you get there? Secondly, how do you have money to pay for it? What if they say, okay, well, we'll give you a free one, but you need your birth certificate or something to prove you are who you say you are. I don't have it. I can't. It's gone. See, so just thinking out loud that these, these questions of, you know, voter ID and other things is, is, it's, it's important to at least ask the question, right? Whatever side you take on this is that, do we truly have free and fair elections in the U.S. today? And that would be the one sort of thing that remains that, that could be an argument. Well, the other Jim Crows that I mentioned are all been ruled unconstitutional. Um, one more thing about democracy, we could go on forever, but just to finish up this, this Cornerstones lecture, and then um, surely we'll get into more later. But the key in democracy, one other key is that there are checks and balances. You, you can say it two ways or many ways, probably checks and balances or separation of powers. Checks and balances means that for every president, there's a Congress, for every Congress there's a Supreme Court, and they can check each other, stop each other, slow down each other. And the reason that's so important, so if you're writing this in your notes, checks and balances means different branches of government having different powers. And we're going to go over all this, you know, in the coming months or weeks, more like it. Different branches of government having different powers, and this is why. Checks and balances or balance of power or separation of powers, all of these same thing, checks and balances exist so that no one person or no one entity gets too much power. An entity is just a fancy word for a thing. An entity could mean a corporation. It could mean a government. It could mean, um, it could mean, it literally essentially is a great word, another way of saying thing. So an entity. Um, so I hope that all makes sense. And I hope that you all see that democracy uh, in all of its different things, um, different facets, I should say, um, is unique in the sense that in, a, in many countries, you're not going to have the right to directly challenge the government and be critical of them, right? In many countries, you don't have full religious freedom or, or religious freedom at all. Many countries don't have the right to assemble. Um, and I lied, I'm actually going to add one more to our list quickly here because in addition to checks and balances um, and having different entities, as we said, check each other is this final one is due process. I promise this is the last one for now. Due process. And it's not spelled D-O, it's spelled D-U-E, D-U-E process. And as boring as that sounds, it's actually the most interesting thing you might ever learn about. We're going to go into depth in all of this, but due process, if you want to put it quickly in your notes, is the your rights when you get in trouble. That's just, I'm going to put it really simply, and then we'll, we'll expand from that. Your rights when you get in trouble. So wait, what if you didn't do this thing that they're accusing you of, but you're in trouble for it? That's why we have due process. So here's what due process is. And you get all of these things in a democracy. In the, in the United States Constitution, it's spelled out in the Fourth, Fifth, and Sixth Amendments and partially some others. So just quickly, ready? In due process, first and foremost, there's a Fourth Amendment that says what? That says there has to be a good reason that the police pulled you over, stopped you, came in your house, meaning what, what, what does a good reason count as? Number one, they saw a crime. Number two, there's probable cause to believe that a crime is being committed, has just been committed, or is about to be committed. So that means there's a really good chance that the gunshots you just heard mean you need to bust down the door or something like that, right? But the other thing, in the absence of that, police have to have a warrant. They have to have a warrant. Now, if you know about Breonna Taylor, you know that couple months too late, Kentucky just banned what's called a no-knock warrant for drug charges. In other words, they went into a young lady's house with a warrant for the wrong place, the wrong people. They didn't have drugs. 
But this young lady got shot and killed in her own bedroom at night for doing nothing wrong simply because the warrant was what's called a no-knock. The police busted in. So her boyfriend, I believe, started shooting in defense in his own house as you would obviously be allowed to do if you didn't know it was the police. And since they didn't announce it was the police, that law has now been changed and other states are looking at changing it. It's just devastating that it takes a person to die for that change to happen, doesn't it? Um, sorry, that's just my human side. Um, <sighs> due process. You need to be told what you're charged with, right? So that's another thing. There's a warrant. Here's what it's for. Or for or probable cause, we think this is what you're doing or... There has to be a reason, a legitimate legal reason, okay? Then here's a couple other great protections you have. And again, I'll try try not to go too deep in these because we're going to come back. But due process, you also get a lawyer, right? If you can't afford one, one will be provided for you. You also have the right to remain silent. These are all due process rights. You have the right to a jury of your peers. You have a right to an hopefully unbiased jury of your peers and a public and speedy trial. These are all under one phrase, due process. Speedy trial, public trial. Why does it need to be speedy? Because if you're innocent, I want to get out of jail and go back to work or get my life back, right? And first of all, good luck having that happen. If you go to jail, if you go to jail on the suspicion of having, say, robbed a store or killed someone, but you didn't do it and you fully prove yourself innocent, good luck after a year of trial or six months of trial, however long it's been, getting out and getting your job back. There's no federal law that mandates the job give you your employment status back. So you want this, what are we, why do I bring that up? You want, if you're innocent, I mean, and if we're guilty, we want you in jail, right? As soon as possible. And if you're innocent, we want you out as soon as possible. So a speedy trial is, is essential. And a public trial is just as essential because do you really want your trial to be behind closed doors where there's no witnesses, the judge or whomever is making the decision can do whatever they want with absolutely no, no accountability? That's not how we do it in our country, right? Due process says it's public. You can literally just go in and sit and watch and reporters will be there. There'll be a public um, transcribance of, of what was said. So... That just gives you a hint. Democracy, man, there's so much that you get. But, um, and we're not, and, and just to be clear, I'm not saying that it's a better form of government than any other form of government. I also teach comparative politics. And there's a lot of other forms of government that are interesting too. But this is the form we have. Um, there's going to be some people who will be very technical and they'll tell you, your teacher's wrong. We don't have a democracy. We have a republic. And that's called semantics, which means words, difference in word games. Um, that, that is what it is. Um, a republic, if you can keep it, is the famous phrase. So just so you know, there's a lot of things in, in politics where a lot of the phraseology is similar and can, can mean the same thing, like when we say checks and balances and separation of power. So with all that said, it was awesome meeting you all. I feel like I know you better now. I hope you're not too intimidated about the course, and I hope that you're not um too confused if you have any questions of course shoot me an email or comment and everyone else can see it if you feel so brave um and otherwise i will see you all soon for the next lecture all the best professor v